Dear Father, this morning we thank you so much for the service of, of Pastor Jose. We pray that as he opens the word before us this morning, that you will touch his lips and bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, it's uh, an exciting time ahead of us. Um, uh, I'm just excited to see what God is going to do uh, in our church and in our churches in this place. Uh, welcome you again, and if you just joined us online, we welcome you again. And um, I will tell you, I'm pretty excited about something. Uh, our very own, uh, one of our very own pianists, Miss Pam Simmering, is going to be one of our pianists at Voice of Prophecy during the meetings. Amen. That's pretty cool. That, that, that's pretty cool. I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, finding different ways to serve. You know, I, I, I'm picking on you a little bit, Pam. But I remember Pam was sitting there saying, "You know, I've just been waiting to see what God's what what God can use me. What what does He want me to do?" And, uh, you know, a few weeks back, Miss Muriel showed up and uh, talked to her about the need of a pianist. And what do you know? God found something for her to do. Amen? Amen. When you want to do something for him, he'll, he'll make it come if you want it. Uh, and it makes a difference. Um, I'm excited, too, uh, for many of you who participated in uh, reversing diabetes. What a blessing. Um, I, I've heard it over and over again. Mike and your team, praise God. Um, we're touching people's lives. Mike shared a testimony with me that, of a lady who went to do her physical and came back and uh, testifying at how everything was doing better, um, you know, and, you know, th this stuff works, and I know it's exciting. These are all different branches of reaching people for Christ, all different ways, and you reach some people some way, and you may reach other people other ways. But together, we're looking for none the same, which is the opportunity to give somebody Jesus. And that's what we're looking for. Well, let's get started this morning. I don't know about you, but I love the Bible. Do you? I love the Bible. The Bible is an amazing book that you can't exhaust, you can't ever fully understand. Uh, I imagine that the Bible is going to be something we're going to enjoy forever. Uh, because it is the awe-inspiring tale of a God recklessly, madly in love with his creation and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's the God we serve. Would you bow your heads with me as we get into God's word uh, this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the word of God. I thank you that it's one of the ways that you speak to us. Lord, I thank you that you even want to speak to us. Because you don't have to. But you choose to because it's your way of showing the relationship you want to have with us. So Lord, uh, give us listening ears. We invite your Holy Spirit for understanding and guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The disciples were a unique bunch. <laughs> As they followed Jesus around, uh, here are these 12, uh, you might say some of them roughnecks, Different walks of life, some fishermen, some tax collectors. Uh, I'm sure if it wasn't for Jesus, they probably wouldn't all get along. But even when Jesus showed up on the scene, they still didn't always all get along. <laughs> um, it, it, it's how uh, sometimes life works. And the disciples, yet in spite of their weaknesses and struggles were known for one common reality, which was they were followers of Jesus. Amen. And I just wonder if people know you as a follower of Jesus, not just a Seventh-day Adventist Christian who doesn't touch certain meats or doesn't even eat meat, 
or goes to worship on a different day than most other people go to worship, I just wonder if when someone sees you or when someone sees me, is the first thing that comes to their minds, whoa, I'm actually meeting a real Christian. I'm meeting an actual follower of Jesus. I don't know about you. I would hope people would say that about me. Would they say it about you? Is it your desire that they would say it about you? I sure hope so. The disciples used to come and ask Jesus a lot of different questions. (laughs) They used to ask him sometimes questions that we would go, yeah, I might ask that, but I won't admit that I would. For example... They asked Jesus, who's the, who will be the greatest amongst them all? And really ask him, as much as they were asking and arguing that within each other, Jesus, reading their hearts and knowing what they were arguing about, because nothing that we do isn't seen by him, amen, uh, went on to answer their so-called inquiry. Sometimes they would come to ask Jesus for things that, again, make us laugh, such as, Lord, can I sit on your right side and my brother on your left? Or can my sons be on your right side or on the left? We ask Jesus for things that sometimes we don't even understand. And yet sometimes the disciples asked very profound questions things of Jesus. Sometimes the disciples recognized they needed more. More from him of what they didn't already have. Or that they had, but realized that it wasn't enough. I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I want you to see one of the things that the disciples approached Jesus directly and requested of him. Luke chapter 17, verse 5, and look what it says. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Have you ever wanted more faith? Have you ever needed more faith? Are you going through something in your life right now that requires faith? If you're not, and I'm just curious, what's going on in your life? Because every day we go through things that require faith. And the disciples came to a point in their life where they realized, Lord, give us more faith. Now, scholars kind of wonder what the full context of this request was. Some attribute this request to an event they would have experienced with Jesus in Matthew 17 and Mark chapter 9. It was an event that we have studied before together, a time when a father came to Christ with his son who was filled with a demon. When he showed up, the only people there were the disciples. Well, the disciples had already been known for following Jesus. They had preached the gospel. They had already been performing miracles. After all, didn't Jesus promise them that whatever I've done, you will do and even more? 
So he brought his son to Jesus and he said, Lord, well, brought his son to the disciples, really, because that's who were there. Jesus was on a mountain and said, please heal my son. The disciples tried and they failed. They didn't know why. And as you know the story, they ended up arguing with the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus comes down from the mountain wondering what's going on and here comes the father begging Jesus please heal my son and if you remember the story Jesus looks at the father and says do you believe that I can do it and the father says I believe help my unbelief Jesus hearing the cry of his heart heals his son. It's a pretty amazing story. In fact, I'll tell you, Little Creek, as I started out this year, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what what do you want your people to hear this year, this 2019 year, as we're uh, into evangelism, as we're into other things? God, what are you wanting from us? And, and, and the Lord really impressed in my heart the need to bring before us the reality that God wants us to prepare ourselves and our families to meet Jesus. Prepare ourselves and our families to meet Jesus. He impressed that on my heart. And what was interesting is I was in your sister church in Goldsboro last week. And as I was teaching uh, Sabbath school, I looked down on the front pew and I noticed next quarter's Sabbath school lesson. Now, I didn't know what next quarter Sabbath school lesson was all about. Until I saw it last week. And would you know, next quarter's lesson is all on the family. It's all on the family. Which leads me to believe that God is trying to tell us something. You see, heaven isn't just for you. Heaven is for you And those that surround you, which include your family, which include your neighbors, which include your co-workers. Your goal is not to get to heaven and be the only one that made it. If that's your goal, you might not get there. God wants to see all our families saved. Salvation is way more than just about you and me. And as we look at our families, there are family members in our lives who don't know who Jesus is. There are family members in our lives that are not following the Savior. Some of them aren't following because we didn't leave a good example. Some of them aren't following because somebody else or something else pulled them out. Some of them aren't following because, guess what? They didn't have the chance to meet them yet. Maybe you were converted later on. But we all have family members that are in need of knowing who Jesus is. And just like the father who brought his son before the disciples and then before Jesus, the question, the desire was that Jesus would reach down and change his son's life. And the question asked of him is, do you believe that I can do it? So some scholars believe that Luke chapter 17 verse 5 was the result of that story, of that experience. Other scholars believe that Luke 17 verse 1 through 4, following Luke's chronology, Because after all, Dr. Luke, when he wrote his gospel, he wanted to write in a way that was more orderly. That was his goal. So some believe that maybe 
Luke 17, 1 through 4, is really the context of the question. And the reality is, no matter what the context was, they both relate to the desire that came into the hearts of the disciples. And I want you to read what Luke 17, 1 through 4 says. And Jesus said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they come. Now, I always find this funny. But you know what Jesus basically told his disciples? To think that you would ever go through this life and never, ever, ever get offended is an impossibility. It's going to happen. To think that we can go through this life and never, ever be offended is unreasonable. The truth is, I meet people all the time who don't come to church or don't want to come to church. And when you ask them one of their reasons, one of the top reasons for not coming to church is somebody offended me. Might be they looked at them weird, said something, I don't know, nudged them on accident. It might have been a legitimate offense. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus, and what I love about Jesus is, Jesus never sugarcoats anything. He tells you exactly what it is. He wants you to understand the world you're living in so you can understand the world he's trying to recreate. Because it looks nothing like the one you're in right now. So if we think we could go through this life and never get offended. Oh, the pastor offended me. The elder offended me. The brother and sister offended me. Somebody offended me. Guess what? Welcome to the club. Because how many times have we offended somebody else? You know how many times I've done it? And I've had to say I'm sorry. Or I had to make it right. I've offended before. Who am I to think that I should never get offended? It happens in this life to think that there would never be a stumbling block before you is to ignore what Jesus says. Family, the enemy is constantly trying to put things in your way to keep you from getting to Jesus. And he'll use Lottie, Dottie, and everybody if that's what he needs to do. He'll do it. But I want you to see what Jesus says next. But woe to him through whom they come. The fact that you in this life could get offended doesn't give you and I the right to purposefully go out and be offensive. Jesus makes it clear, it'll happen, but that's not an excuse to be that person. And look what he says next, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, that he should, then that he should offend one of these little ones. That's pretty deep, isn't it? So be careful. Be careful what we do, what we say. He says, man, if you're going to live your life being a person that easily offends, not caring what happens, then realize something. <laughs> it's going to be difficult for you. Now, I want you to see what verse 3 says. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, and some Bibles don't say against you, they just say if your brother sins, be it a sin against you or a sin, period. I want you to see what Jesus says. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Oh, we love that part of that text. <laughs> Woo! Oh, man, I can't wait for that opportunity, right? Jesus gave me permission. If you get it wrong, I'm coming for you. After all, he told me it was my responsibility to rebuke. 
I meet people like that all the time. I'm the great watchman of the church. You are not. Jesus is. You are not the great watchman. Get off the wall. We don't need you there. We don't need you on the wall watching anybody. You need to be watching yourself. Uh, That's not to take out of context when Jesus calls us watchmen, you understand? But sometimes we take those verses and then we apply them the way we think it should look. So we go, all right, someone offends me, you know what I'm ready to do? I'm ready to walk up to that person and say, you know what you did to me, Larry? You know exactly what you did to me. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And you meant to do it, too. You imagine? Ah, and so we get angry, right? Because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to correct you, and I'm going to get it out of you because Jesus said so. But you ought to read the rest of the verse and ask yourself, what kind of correction is Jesus asking us to give? Look what it says. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And look what it says. And if he repents, do what? What is the ultimate goal of correcting somebody else, especially someone who has offended you? The goal is not to go gotcha. The goal is to open the door for the power of forgiveness. It is the goal of bringing reconciliation. God is a God of reconciliation. What happened at the cross happened because I have offended God over and over and over again. But God in his love for me, God who declares that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, demonstrated his love towards me that even while I was committed Committing the offense. He died for me. He died for me. He gave up his life. When the one who should have had to have done it was me. I committed the offense. He never did. He's never offended a single one of us. Not once. If I'm going to go to someone to correct them, it should be because I want to see the relationship get stronger. Not that I'm trying to be right and finally have the one-up men of being able to say you are wrong. It's not about that. By the way, that's very countercultural. Jesus was very countercultural. That's not the way the world deals with offenses. In fact, if you think that's tough enough, I want you to see what he says next. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall what? Whoa! Now that is counter Jose. Because I'm going to tell you something. You offend me once in a day. All right, Jesus, help me. I'm going to forgive you. It's all good. You do it again on the same day. I'm going to go, mm. all right, Jesus, help me. I think maybe, you know, you, you, you just didn't see what you did. You do it the third time in the day. I'm going, oh, heck no. <laughs> now I think you're doing it on purpose. You go fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, by the seventh time, you and I are outside, and it's not to have a conversation. (laughs) Am I wrong? Is that not the human way we are? But what does Jesus say? If he offends seven times On the same day, you should seek to forgive. Mm -hmm. 
Does that not give you context of what the disciples ask next? Lord, increase our faith. Whoa. If this is the context, and it's the way Luke puts it in context, right? It means to believe that when the disciples heard this word, they were cut to the heart. Lord, what you're asking us to do is impossible. Who in their right mind would ever do something like that? And I want you to understand throughout the course of this year as we talk about family, as we talk about preparing our families for the second coming of Christ and and realizing that your family isn't just your blood family, it's your church family and it's also our family as a whole on this planet. Because we all come from one family. Good old Adam and Eve. And if you want to get a little closer, good old Noah and his sons. We are all, one shape or another, related. It's the reality. We all. And here, we see a dynamic that is hard even for families to receive, no matter what family unit we're talking about, which is the reality that I have to forgive over and over again. But it's not even that. Jesus is saying forgiveness is the way to deal with any offense. You want to get rid of the fact that you feel offended? Then forgive. You know, half the time, we don't want to forgive. We hold on to the offense, and the offender has forgotten about it. They don't even know it happens sometimes. I always laugh at that as a, as a minister. <laughs> you know how many times I've, quote, offended someone and had no idea I did it? You know? I hear about it three months later. Well, oh, I haven't seen you, pastors, because you said something, and... Uh, I got upset, and I'm sitting here going, what did I say? Well, you said blase, blase. I did? When did I say that? Three months. Oh. I said, I wasn't thinking about. I remember one time somewhere, I said, I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking, because I haven't, I haven't thought anything of that sort about you. Oh, well, I let it go. Yeah, apparently you did. We didn't see you for a while. The desire to seek forgiveness. You and I are going to study that experience throughout the book of Genesis as we study different families in the Bible. Because you know what I love about studying the families of the Bible? They're just like the families in 2019. They haven't changed. The dynamics are the same. You know, we tend to think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we think of them as these over-glorified, holy men of God that never, ever, ever had any problems, never argued with their wives, never had problems with their children. All their children followed Jesus. I'm here to tell you something. Read the story again, and we will together. We're going to see how over and over again you see brothers who couldn't get along. Uh, Wives. Yeah, wives. We'll talk about that. But wives that couldn't get along. You had issues between uh, uh, cousins and nephews and uncles and, and, and all sorts of problems develop. And what will we see? We're not looking at perfect families. We're looking at a perfect God producing perfection out of imperfect families he's doing that or at least trying to so the disciples realizing what a big reality it was to forgive then say you gotta give me more faith now you gotta understand how important that is if you read revelation 14 verse 12 and if you've been in your sabbath school quarterly we've been reading it by the way i'm just gonna say a short side note i was talking to dan about this this week you know what's interesting to me i hear people say three angels message three angels message three angels message i'm letting you know we're about to study it again so if you're not a part of it, that's you on you. 
That's not on me. We study our stuff over and over and over again. In Revelation 14, 12, we have studied again the reality that Jesus says something about the saints that make it through the final trouble that's going to come on this land, and we're almost there. And the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. You ready? Here are those who keep the commandments of God. But watch this. And have the faith, what? In Jesus? Hmm. It's a little different, isn't it? To have faith in someone versus to have faith of someone. Of means it's something I have to receive. Faith actuated in the life of a believer is not faith that you produced. It's faith that he produced in you and in me. And oftentimes when we read, here is the perseverance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God, as good Adventists, we tend to focus on the commandment part. Now, when you already understand that God's commandments are important, you understand? Do you believe that? Are God's commandments important? Yeah, there's not nine of them. There's not eight of them. There's not five. There's ten. And let's add on to the fact, anything else God commands us to do is a command. If it's in the word and he's asking us to do it, then we should. So commandment keeping people, once you're engaged in the knowledge that we have to keep the commandments, let me tell you, then your focus needs to shift. What do you mean, pastor? Because just like the disciples, when they realized what God wanted from them, what did that cause their focus to shift to? Lord, increase our faith. I need the faith of Jesus. And here's why. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 6 very quickly. You know this verse. Hebrews 11 verse 6. This is very big. In fact, one of the things I love about the Bible, there's a lot of talk of the impossible and the possible, you know? I mean, you remember the rich man when he came to Jesus, he said, sell everything you have and follow me, right? Give it to the poor and follow me. And the, and, and the rich man walked away and then uh, the, Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples' response is, man, so then it's, in, how in the world could a man ever get saved? And Jesus says, well, with man, it's impossible, but with God... All things are possible. In fact, God reiterates that with Mary and Joseph when he gives their call that they're going to have the Christ child. And when he gives that call, the angel tells them because with God, nothing is impossible. Realize over and over again, you get that contrast between what is possible and what is impossible. And the common denominator is that with man, there is so many impossibilities. But with God, All the possibilities are available to you. It's possible. Nothing's impossible. So I want you to see one of those impossible verses in Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, what does it say? Without what? It is impossible to please. Now, You could say please him, but if you have your Bible and you see him in italics, you see that? Some of you have that. That implies that that word was added in order to give a little bit more clarification. Most of the time, that's really good. It's because, remember, we're translating from one language to another, and sometimes it's hard. But just imagine what it says. But without faith, it's impossible to please, period, Please God? Please man? I mean, after all, are we not to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself? I'm telling you, without faith, it's impossible. You can't do it. 
You can talk about it. You can say how important it is. But without faith, you lack the key that can make you everything God wants you to be. You lack it. So you can talk about the commandments till you're blue in the face. Without faith, that knowledge becomes nothing. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Listen, when the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith, they understood there is no way to live the way God wants me to live unless you give me more faith. There is no way to forgive my brother the way I should or to even approach my brother with the desire to be, you know, you know, just think about that for a moment. I mean, when you're offended by someone, why would you approach the person in order to open the door for forgiveness? It's just so weird. You know, if someone offends me, typically my idea is to sit down and wait till they want forgiveness. And then I'll... Forgive them if I'm good. Jesus says, you don't wait for the person. You should be desiring that door open yourself. But in order for me to have that desire, I have to have faith. The perseverance of the faith are those who keep the commandments of God because they have the faith of Jesus. And as we close, I want you to see what Jesus says in verses 6 through 10 of Luke 17. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, Luke 17, verse 6, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him who has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Pretty big, isn't it? In fact, this message was inspired in my heart, being at Evangelism Impact. One of the preachers brought us to these verses. And I've read them over and over again. And I sit there and I go, wow, what a thought. Increase our faith. And Jesus says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can pull that mulberry tree right out of its roots and throw it in the sea. Now, does that mean that when we leave this place, we should all go through the trees around the church and tell them to move? Just to see if it works? No, Jesus is telling you something. If you want more faith, it doesn't start by saying, oh, I don't have a lot of faith, so therefore I can't do anything. Jesus says it's not about how much you have. It's about how real what you have is. Your faith can be small like a mustard seed, but when that mustard seed is planted in the ground and it starts to grab the nutrients from the soil, and the water that comes from the sky. And that seed begins to then sprout and grow. Eventually, that mustard seed becomes a, a tree. A full plant or a full tree. And all of a sudden, your faith that was real grew all on its, on its own. If you have faith, even if it's a little, and the Bible says God gives each of us a measure of 
faith. He gives it to each of us. Then that means that faith that he has given me, I ought to place right where it can receive all the nutrients that I can get to grow that faith. The word of God. Prayer, being a part of the people of God, being here as we work together and we grow together, witnessing. Those are all nutrients that are meant to increase our faith, even the trials of these lives are meant to help increase our faith. But we have to grab hold of it. But we also have to grab hold of that faith, realizing we're nothing but servants. And what really hit me there is Jesus uses an example the disciples know all well, don't they? A master and a servant. Does a servant go out and work all day long and come back and the master says, sit down, I'll cook you a meal and serve you. They knew that what the answer to that was. No. No. The answer was, you worked all day out in the field. If you were servant, you came back, and guess what you did for the master? You cooked the meal and served him. Does a servant back in those days expect for the master to come up to him and go, oh, you did such a great job? You know what? In those days, the answer to that question was, It wasn't expected. Why? Because you were the servant. He was the master. You were merely doing what your role required you to do. Understanding something. God doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe me a single thing. He doesn't owe you anything. I ought to serve him because of who he is And that's it. Expecting nothing in return. And sometimes we serve and we want people to acknowledge how great we serve. And when we don't get the acknowledgement, we don't want to serve any longer. And I'm sitting here going, let me tell you, while it's good to acknowledge and give thanks to each other as we go along, realize something. You're a servant. I'm a servant. We're all serving the master. Period. We're doing what we deserve. We're the unprofitable ones. He's the profitable one. That doesn't mean I'm unworthy. I'm worthy because of his worthiness. Outside of him, I'm unprofitable. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And that's what God invites us to do. He invites us to grab hold of his faith. Even if what we grab is just a small bit at a moment. But to begin to allow him to nurture it and grow that seed. To produce in us the desire to serve. Not because we're looking for recognition, but serving because that's all our hearts desire to do. To serve rather than to be served. And here's what's the kicker that I love about this illustration. (laughs) Jesus gives an earthly example. Do you imagine that our heavenly master has told us in this book that one day all his servants will be with him. And when they're with him, he's going to have them sit at the table. He's going to gird his loins. And as he washed his disciples' feet many years before, he will begin to serve all those who have arrived into the kingdom of heaven. And he will give crowns for each one on their head, acknowledging what has been done while living on this earth. And you know what's wild? I don't deserve any of it. Why should he have to say, well done, good and faithful servant to me? Because everything faithful about me came from him. 
everything. It's why Revelation says that we'll take those crowns and throw them at his feet. In recognition that those who make it to heaven recognize as we sing in the song, not that I was able, but that he is able. He made it happen. And so Little Creek, I want to invite you, like the disciples, to come before Jesus today and say, Lord, increase my faith. Help me, Father, because guys, life isn't getting easier. I want to tell you one brief thing. Your church board has stepped out in faith this year. We have asked God to allow us to reach 20 souls for the kingdom of heaven this year. Are you listening? How many souls? 20. Now, you might sit there and say, that's a big number. Guess what? We've got a big God. Amen. 20. And I want to invite you to join our leadership. One, in praying for those 20 souls. No, we're not praying and thinking about the number. You know, some people, they focus more on the 20. I'm focusing on the latter, the souls. You understand? But we're laying a number before the Lord because we are laying a goal, a desire that we want to work towards in faith, believing that God can give us all that we ask of him. But we also have to recognize, and Spirit of Prophecy says this over and over again. Oftentimes, we do not receive what we ask for because our faith doesn't match what we're asking. And neither do our actions. Book of James says that too, right? Book of James says, ask everything without doubting. Together, we have a work to be done. And guess what? We've been doing it for the last year, giving Bible studies to people, planting seeds in their life. And now we also have this Revelation Speaks piece that's going to be huge. You can bring family members, friends, people to come. This is a big event. And imagine, we're talking about being there with thousands of other people. Hundreds, thousands. It all depends on what God desires to give us. The way we're headed we're already going to hit a thousand. I want us to be ready. I want us to be ready for the souls God is ready to give us. And I want us to work together with a yearning in our hearts to see that every seat in Little Creek Seventh-day Adventist Church one day would have a body in it. But that seat isn't just for that body. That seat is to encourage the person on that body to get more to be ready for Jesus to return. I need you to join me and join your leadership. Join the people you hear who get up and invite you to be a part of the ministries of this church. Join us in faith. Join us on your knees. Say, Lord, give us that 20. Show us that you can and that we can together with you. Make it so. Five months ago, we didn't have a strong children's department. We started praying. We started working. And now we have one. Amen. If that doesn't show you that God can work in us, I don't know what will. But I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Are you ready, Little Creek? Are you ready for everything God's going to do in 2019? I am. And I'm asking him to do it right now. Stand with me if you would.